Sunday, May 22, 2005, Huntington, West Virginia. At around 4.30 a.m., four local teens are out and about, celebrating the upcoming end of another school year and the approaching summertime. Earlier that night, two of them, Michael Dillon and Megan Poston, had attended Huntington High School's annual senior prom. The pair are in the company of 18-year-old Edric Clark of South Point, Ohio, and 19-year-old Dante Ward of Huntington. For reasons that remain shrouded in mystery, the foursome drove to Ward's home on Charleston Avenue. Moments later, gunfire and screams for mercy pierce the morning air. The shots claim the lives of all four teens. Sixteen years later, Both the motive and the identity of the killers remain a mystery. The shots that echoed through Fairfield West that morning shook the city of Huntington and reverberate to this very day. Despite a rigorous and thorough investigation, authorities were unable to fathom why anyone would so viciously take the lives of four people, none of whom had yet to reach the age of 20. Theories and rumors abounded, but as to hard facts and solid leads, The pickings were maddeningly slim. Even today, authorities remain unclear about many things. They are not even able to say with certainty how the victims spent the last hours of their young lives. Now, after 16 years, they are hopeful that the fear and perhaps misplaced loyalties may have abated, and that someone will finally muster the courage to come forward and help bring down the final curtain on this fourfold tragedy. For high school students across the United States, the month of May typically means baseball, final exams, and continuously mounting anticipation as the summer vacation looms just over the horizon. For those below the senior level, it means that three months of no homework and no detention are imminent. For those of the senior class, it means that one chapter of their lives is approaching an end, and another, the entry into adulthood, is about to begin. A time of excitement and joy for many. For others, a time of reflection, contemplation, and even sadness as a parting of the ways approaches for many longtime friendships. Nowhere is this myriad of emotions more evident than in college towns like Huntington, West Virginia. Situated at the point where the states of Ohio, Kentucky, and West Virginia join together to form the Tri-State, Huntington serves as a gateway of sorts to the great Ohio Valley. Since 1873, it has rambled on to the ever-present cadence of railroad cars and sternwheel steamboats. At one point, it held the distinction of being the largest city in the state, surpassing even the great steel center of Wheeling. Throughout the 1990s and the early years of the 21st century, Huntington was primarily known as the home of Marshall University and the legendary Thundering Herd. However, by 2005, Huntington and much of the rest of the Ohio Valley had become notable for other, far less savory reasons. A steady, seemingly endless flow of narcotics, most of it beginning its southern journey in Detroit, began to flow into the River City. Inevitably, the crime rate rose and local feelings of security plummeted. Saturday, May 21st, 2005, was slated as prom night for many of the high schools in the surrounding area, including Huntington High School. 
17-year-old Michael Dillon, a junior at Huntington High School, planned to attend with his 16-year-old girlfriend, Megan Poston, a sophomore at Cabell Midland High School in Barbersville, West Virginia. Earlier that same day, 19-year-old Dante Ward of Huntington was looking forward to celebrating his 20th birthday on Monday. In South Point, Ohio, it was also prom day, but 18-year-old senior Edric Clark opted not to attend the evening's revelry with his girlfriend. Clark, too, was eagerly anticipating his upcoming birthday on Sunday. The same day, he was slated to graduate from South Point High School. All in all, the mood was both festive and joyful for everyone concerned. No one could have possibly known that before the sun would rise on May 22nd, all four would have their lives brutally taken. Family, friends, and indeed an entire community would be left feeling as though they had been collectively kicked in the head. The exact movements and actions of the four teens on Saturday the 21st and Sunday the 22nd have never been fully ascertained. Sixteen years later, there remain many missing pieces to the puzzle of the last hours of their lives. As with any crime, especially a multiple homicide, the timeline of events leading up to the tragic ending can be crucial. At around 3 p.m. on Saturday, Edric Clark was dropped off at the corner of 9th Avenue and 15th Street by his mother, Joanne. Although he had attended South Point High School during the 2004-2005 academic year, Clark was originally a native of Cincinnati and had been living with his grandmother in Huntington since the previous March. According to Joanne Clark, her son was in good spirits, already celebrating his 18th birthday, even though it would not officially arrive until midnight. His actions over the next nine or so hours are speculative. At some point in the early evening, he's reported to have spoken by phone to his girlfriend, Brittany McCoy. McCoy later stated that Edric gave no indication of just how he planned to spend the rest of the evening. As the witching hour approached, more of Clark's family and friends began calling his cell phone to wish him a happy birthday. By all accounts, Clark was still upbeat and exuberant and gave no indication of any trouble. At around 5 p.m., Michael Dillon, Megan Poston, their family, and some friends gathered in the Ritter Park Rose Garden along McCoy Road. The pair had already donned their formal attire and, like many others, chose the scenic surroundings as a place to pose for posterity. Photos and videos taken at the time show a happy, smiling couple with a full slate of activities planned for that night. After having their photos taken, Michael and Megan went to dinner before proceeding on to the Huntington High School prom. In 2005, the Huntington High School prom was held here at the Big Sandy Superstore Arena, now known as the Mountain Health Arena, along Huntington's riverfront. The prom itself was scheduled to run from 8 p.m. to midnight. Several attendees recalled having seen both Michael and Megan at the arena. At some point during the evening, the pair posed for these portraits their expressions giving no hint that anything was amiss. These videos were taken at the Huntington High School prom by local CBS affiliate WOWK at approximately 8.30 p.m. It is safe to say that none of those enjoying the party atmosphere could have ever imagined the tragedy which would soon confront them. Multiple witnesses advised that the couple left the arena at approximately 10.30 p.m. Again, their precise actions over the next six hours are not known with certainty. No one at the prom recalls having heard either of them allude to their plans for the rest of the night. 
Huntington High School is located just over five miles southeast of the Big Sandy Arena on the southern side of Interstate 64. An all-night after-prom lock-in was scheduled to begin there at 1 a.m., Sunday, May 22nd. Michael and Megan's families later reported that they had planned to attend this event. At this juncture, an element of confusion enters. Michael's father, Gary Dillon, later advised that Megan's aunt drove the couple to Huntington High School for the after-prom and actually observed them enter the building. However, school officials and students reported that neither Michael nor Megan ever arrived at the after-prom party. Police and Principal Karen Oldham later confirmed that neither of their names appeared on the entrance ledgers. Six to eight chaperones had been posted around the facility, and Oldham was adamant that no one could have entered the school without signing in or left without notifying a parent or guardian. If Michael and Megan had somehow managed to elude detection and leave the school's premises, where could they have gone? Two hours later, at approximately 3 a.m., another Huntington High School student reported having seen Megan Poston at a house party in downtown Huntington. The student was quite certain about the identification, as Megan was still attired in her formal prom dress, reportedly the only girl at the party to be dressed in such a manner. At approximately the same time, 19-year-old Dante Ward was observed at the Fat Cat's Bar on 4th Avenue. An acquaintance of Ward's, Brandy McCoy, later recalled having seen Ward at the bar sometime between 3 and 3.30 a.m. McCoy reported that she talked with Ward about his upcoming birthday, but he apparently never specified just what his plans were for the coming hours. According to McCoy, Dante appeared to be alone and left on his own at approximately 3.30 a.m. For reasons which may never be known, Dante Ward placed a number of calls to Brandy McCoy's cell phone over the next 19 minutes. Records show that the last call from Ward's phone was made at 3.49 a.m. on May 22, 2005. Regretfully, Brandy McCoy did not answer any of the attempted calls, a decision which would later lead her to wonder what might have been. Just what happened during the next 40 or so minutes is unknown. At some point, Megan Poston, Michael Dillon, Edric Clark, and Dante Ward came together. Around 4.30 a.m., the foursome arrived at Ward's home on Charleston Avenue. What happened next continues to defy both logic and reason. The 12-year-old daughter of neighbor Christy Thomas was shaken from her slumber by the sound of gunshots. She later told her mother that the shots sounded like cannon fire. Seconds later, a terrified female voice pierced the morning air, desperately pleading, Please, don't shoot me. Please, don't shoot me. Another round of concussive shots rang out. Young Thomas dashed to her bedroom window, which looked out on the front lawn. Two bodies lay motionless in the grass next to the neighboring driveway. The terrified youth ran to her parents' bedroom and the police were called. Residents who had not been roused by the volley of gunshots were soon awakened by an armada of emergency vehicles, which descended on the neighborhood en masse. Authorities first on the scene found three of the victims had already succumbed to their injuries. One of them, barely clinging to life, was whisked away to Cabell Huntington Hospital. Tragically, they too later died as a result of their wounds. By 5 a.m., the entire block had been secured. As the sun slowly rose, the enormity of the crime began to dawn upon the investigators. Three dead one dying, and apparently no eyewitnesses. News of the quadruple shooting sent shockwaves through Huntington and beyond. 
Four young lives are taken by gunfire early Sunday morning. An emotional crowd converges on Charleston Avenue, trying to grasp the reality of the gruesome crime. Since 1981, we haven't had a uh, quadruple slain such as this. I just think it's a shame that four young people lost their lives. The four lives taken were four local teenagers. 19-year-old Dante Ward, he lives on the street the shootings took place. 16-year-old Megan Poston, a junior at Cabell Midland High School. 17-year-old Michael Dillon, a junior at Huntington High School, a backup quarterback on the football team. And Edric Clark from South Point, Ohio. He turned 18 just hours before the shooting took place. Know how to how do you console someone like that that's lost a, a young child? I, I don't know. Huntington police detectives are working around the clock, sorting through evidence, trying to find answers to the senseless murder. Meanwhile, neighbors on Charleston Avenue are shocked at what happened just doors from their own homes. A neighborhood they say is relatively quiet and always safe. I've lived here for about 37 years. It's a good neighborhood. We've never had anything like this before. Even the recent uptick in drug-related crimes had not prepared the citizenry for anything of this magnitude. I'll never, I'll never forget Megan's voice just, just begging for her life. A life taken all too soon. 16 years old, plenty to live for. But it was all cut short early Sunday morning. Michael Thomas lives in the house next door to the crime scene. He and his 12-year-old daughter woke up to gunshots. Daddy, there's two people dead in the driveway. Um, I said, are they dead or are they just laying down? She said, Daddy, they're not moving. Shocking words no one wants to hear, especially from their young child. And then the Charleston Avenue resident heard Megan Poston pleading for her life. Please don't shoot me. I'm sorry. Please don't kill me. And then there was two more gunshots. Megan Poston is the youngest victim of the quadruple murder. The junior at Cabell Midland High School was active in the school's child care academy. The program prepares high school students who want to work with children after graduation. These flowers in this pink cross mark the spot where Megan Poston lost her life. I spoke with her grandmother who says the 16-year-old loved life. She was a straight-A student and didn't judge anyone from what they looked like. And she says her granddaughter was most likely in the wrong place at the wrong time. With four young lives lost, family and friends continue to pray and console one another. At the same time, they're looking for answers. Whoever did this, this, this young girl begged for her life. She begged him not to kill her, but he didn't care. Family, friends, classmates, and even total strangers were momentarily paralyzed in disbelief. The following evening, many of the shocked and saddened citizens including family members of the victims, gathered around the crime scene for a candlelight vigil. A peace, Lord, that would comfort us. Over 300 people came from near and far to support one another. I woke up yesterday morning and my daughter said Michael has been shot and he's dead. And she was asking me to do something and I couldn't do anything for him. Michael Dillon's grandfather is not the only one feeling helpless. Prom night ended violently, but it had begun with anticipated joy for the 17-year-old and his prom date, 16-year-old Megan Poston. Her uncle saw her off. I told her she's flawless, and she said, I feel beautiful tonight. And I just, you know, I looked at her and I thought, you know, she's turned into a woman now. 19-year-old Dante Ward was giving his friend Dylan and Poston a ride home from the Huntington High School prom. Friends at this candlelight vigil say Dante was always willing to help others. He was the type of person that wouldn't let you go to drugs. He wouldn't let any kid go that way because he would help them. Classmates say that was also a trait of Ward's childhood friend, 18-year-old Edric Clark. He was a real loving person. He always, he was always there if you needed him. Ward's friends say the 14 stopped at the home to gather items for his child. It was a fatal stop. Whether they were family members, friends, or strangers, one thing that everybody agrees on here is that these four young people lost their lives too early, and something needs to be done to make sure this doesn't happen again. People need to respond in a community effort where this is what's going to be the future. As if to reassure the bereaved, a damp, drizzly evening was soon capped by the one eternal sign of hope and promise, a rainbow. Certain that time was now their worst enemy, authorities fanned out. The ledgers from the after-prom party were quickly secured. 
Another Charleston Avenue resident, Stephanie Holman, also reported hearing a rapid series of gunshots during the pre-dawn hours. I thought it was firecrackers. You know how firecrackers go off. It was just right up, you know, da-da-da-da-da-da-da, da-da-da-da. And uh, it's just like three or four times like that. Unfortunately, no one in the neighborhood reported having actually witnessed the shooting or even having seen a vehicle leave the scene. Stun paralysis quickly gave way to anger, especially among the residents of Fairfield West, the designation given to the neighborhood where the shootings had occurred. Huntington City Councilwoman Brandy Jacobs-Jones grew fearful of possible vigilante justice. The shock and disgust was not confined to the tri-state area. News of the quadruple homicide made headlines and led the newscasts across the country. Almost from the outset, one word was seemingly on everyone's lips. Detroit. And it was not an unreasonable assumption. Even before the murders, local authorities, along with the FBI and the ATF, had identified a cyclical supply chain of drugs and firearms whose name was both apropos and cliché, the Detroit Connection. Despite this tongue-in-cheek moniker, the North-South Circle of illicit commerce was as deadly as it was simple. Simply put, the Detroit Connection was, and to some extent still is, a classic case of supply and demand. Throughout the 90s and into the early 2000s, demand for narcotics in the Appalachian and Ohio Valley regions had risen sharply. While methamphetamines and cannabis could be produced and cultivated locally, substances like crack cocaine had to be funneled in from outside sources. The relative scarcity of supply meant that these harder substances commanded a premium in medium-sized towns like Huntington. Yet, the supply was only half of the vicious cycle. Once delivered to the region, dealers and suppliers would next take advantage of West Virginia's more liberal firearms laws to increase their profits even more. These firearms would then be transported back to northern cities like Detroit, where they too could then be sold at a significant premium. Once sold, The profits from the arms sales would then be used to procure more drugs, and the cycle would start again. Given the location of the shootings, authorities naturally turned their immediate attention to Dante Ward. Though they could never quite put their finger on it, authorities felt that the motive for the shooting, whatever it may be, was in some way centered on Ward. But Dante Ward was no Hunter S. Thompson, He was a lifelong Huntington resident who was mostly described as lovable, friendly, generous, and business-minded. A 2003 graduate of Huntington High School, Ward was later described as a straight-A student. At the time of his death, Dante and his father were planning on opening a clothing store together in Huntington. He was not stingy with his time and did volunteer youth work for community summer camps as well as the Huntington Housing Authority. And yet, the shootings had occurred in front of Ward's home. In 2005, Dante Ward lived here, at 1410 Charleston Avenue in the community of Fairfield West. According to his family and landlord, he had lived at the location for approximately two months. Curiously, authorities learned that this was not the first time Dante Ward had come under fire. On February 7th of that same year, he had been wounded in the left wrist in a drive-by shooting in the 1600 block of 8th Avenue. Authorities, however, quickly described that case as closed and felt it was unrelated to the shootings on May 22nd. The pressure on law enforcement to act and act fast was palpable and seemed to quickly bear fruit. On Monday, May 23rd, local, state, and federal authorities executed a pair of morning raids. At 10 a.m., clad in riot gear and carrying high-powered weapons, authorities descended on 815 11th Avenue in Huntington. 
Two persons were arrested on site and two others captured while attempting to flee in a vehicle. A short time later, another squad moved in on the Stone Lodge in Barbersville, approximately 15 miles to the east. Three additional arrests were made. Later that same day, two more suspects were arrested as the result of a traffic stop. All told, 16 persons were detained or arrested on Monday. Twelve of them were later discovered to have ties to Detroit. Stop people, if they have a warrant on them, we arrest them. If they have evidence on them, we arrest them, if, whatever the case is. But no direct arrest in reference to I them. I think the community understands that, that we're throwing everything at this investigation at our disposal. Um, we want to catch these individuals uh, as bad as my heart goes out to the victims' families. Obviously, I, I can't comprehend the pain they must be going through. Uh, but we've got guys that are working literally around the clock in this case, and um, we desperately want to catch these people. Two more raids were carried out on the morning of Tuesday, May 24th. No additional arrests were made, but the action on the part of law enforcement drew an immediate and positive response. The public, including many of the family and friends of the victims, rejoiced. Their joy, however, was soon tempered when Huntington Police Captain Steve Hall announced that no charges directly related to the shootings had been filed. Further souring the mood, the tragic events of May 22nd seemed to resurrect an underlying feeling of frustration with Huntington Chief of Police Arthur Bumgarner, along with several local political figures. During a city council meeting on the evening of May 23rd, Councilwoman Brandy Jacobs-Jones applauded the quick reaction of law enforcement in general, but leveled criticism at Chief Bumgarner. Jacobs-Jones accused Bumgarner of not having been personally present at the crime scene, an accusation later proven to be false, but also recounting what she described as an ongoing pattern of aloofness on his part. Chief Bumgarner's reaction was swift and defiant. He stated, quote, I've done everything I should be doing. I don't see why there is a reason for me to answer any of these questions because I would be responding to whatever Jacobs Jones is trying to implicate. I think this is a poor time to be politicking. We have more important issues at hand. End quote. Huntington Mayor David Fellenton came to Bumgarner's defense, stated that he had kept him fully updated on all developments. Felton chalked the criticisms up to jealousy and animosity over looming budget cuts. While the unfortunate political intrigues played out in the background, the law enforcement investigation continued. Among other things, they continued to try and piece together a comprehensive timeline of events and locations leading up to the shootings. From the beginning, this working timeline has consistently resembled a chain with several missing links. Based upon information made public by law enforcement over the last 16 years, we have attempted again to reconstruct as near as possible just how the events of May 21st and May 22nd came to their tragic climax. Saturday, May 21, 2005, approximately 3 p.m. Edric Clark is dropped off at the corner of 9th Avenue and 15th Street by his mother, Joanne. This T intersection, the site of the St. Peter Claver Catholic Church, is located two blocks west of Halgreer Boulevard and only six blocks north of Dante Ward's home at 1410 Charleston Avenue. Ward's home and the St. Peter's Church are located in the community of Fairfield West. Fairfield East and Fairfield West are separated from downtown Huntington by the main line of the CSX Railway. Two hours later, at approximately 5 p.m., Megan Poston and Michael Dillon pose for photographs in the Ritter Park Rose Garden, located here less than a mile southwest of Dante Ward's home. 
These home movies taken that evening show the couple together less than nine hours before the shooting. Megan and Michael are next reported to have gone out to dinner before making their way to the Huntington High School prom. At 8 p.m., the Huntington High School prom officially began. The former Big Sandy Arena, where the prom was being held, is located in downtown Huntington, two blocks west of Harris Riverfront Park and the then-recently-constructed Pullman Square. Most Saturday nights, this district is the center of activity in Huntington. Both foot and vehicular traffic usually remain constant well into the early morning hours. At approximately 10.30 p.m., Michael and Megan are observed leaving the Big Sandy Arena. Their exact movements over the next few hours are either unknown or have not been made public. 11.50 p.m. Edric Clark's uncle, Shannon Garrett, calls Edric to wish him a happy 18th birthday. Clark told his uncle that he was already celebrating, but did not give any details about his plans for the coming hours. According to Garrett, Clark's last words spoken to him were, I will get with you tomorrow. I am bringing in my birthday. Though it is only speculation, authorities have hypothesized that Edric Clark and Dante Ward may already have been together at this point. According to Michael Dillon's father, Gary, Megan and Michael were driven to Huntington High School for an after-prom party by Megan's aunt. The party was not scheduled to begin until 1 a.m., one hour after the prom itself had ended. Megan's aunt later reported that she drove the couple to Huntington High School and observed them enter the building. Faculty and students, however, maintained that Michael and Megan never arrived at the after-prom party, and their names do not appear in any of the entrance ledgers. Huntington High School is located here, just south of Interstate 64 along Highlander Way, which branches off of Halgreer Boulevard and dead ends at the school's campus. This location is approximately five miles to the south of downtown Huntington and the former Big Sandy Arena. Approximately two hours later, a Huntington High School senior, Caitlin Ellis, reportedly saw Megan Poston at a house party in downtown Huntington. Ellis was confident about her sighting, as she recalled that Megan was the only girl present wearing a prom dress. At the same approximate time, Dante Ward was observed at Fat Cat's Bar on 4th Avenue. Brandy McCoy, a friend of Dante's, recalled that she talked with him at the bar for a time during 3 and 3.30 a.m., but he never alluded to what his plans were for the rest of the morning. According to McCoy, Dante left the bar at about 3.30 a.m. alone. During the next 19 minutes, Dante Ward placed several telephone calls to Brandy McCoy's cell phone. Records show that the last call was placed at 3.49 a.m. Brandy McCoy did not answer any of these incoming calls. Just how Michael Dillon, Megan Poston, Edric Clark, and Dante Ward came together during the next 41 or so minutes is unclear. Authorities are not even certain of the exact dynamic of the relationship between the four teens. If any independent witnesses observed the four together prior to the shootings, their names and accounts have never been released. Finally, at approximately 4.30 a.m., gunshots and pleas for mercy are heard outside of Dante Ward's home, back at 1410 Charleston Avenue. There are no eyewitnesses to the actual shooting or fleeing of the shooter or shooters. Law enforcement officials in Huntington open direct lines of communications with authorities in Detroit. During the first week of June, two detectives with the Huntington Police Department traveled to the Motor City, a trip which was initially described as being primarily for an information exchange. I'm certainly not saying they're going up there to get a suspect, but it's not a stretch to think that they've gone back. 
Captain Steve Hall says new leads continue to come in every day. He credits cooperation with the community, many of whom have been helpful and upfront with detectives. But Captain Hall says there's a lot of information they can't release just yet. On Friday, June 3rd, the Huntington detectives assisted the Detroit police in the arrest of 23-year-old Sherylethia Holmes on federal drug charges. 23-year-old Cheryl Lethia Holmes from Detroit was charged with possession of crack cocaine with the intent to deliver. Those charges stem from an arrest back in February at the 8th Avenue Bar in Huntington. Now, Huntington detectives believe Holmes was in the area the 14s were killed. They're not labeling her a suspect, only a person of interest. Two days later, according to the Detroit News, federal agents told a magistrate judge in Detroit that they had information linking Holmes with the murder of Dante Ward. According to the agents, Holmes, known on the streets as Bunny, sought to have Ward killed after he allegedly stole either drugs, money, or both from her. Authorities, however, have never been able to muster enough evidence or probable cause to formally charge Holmes with the Huntington shootings. It was later revealed that the Huntington detectives who traveled to Detroit had carried with them a federal warrant for Holmes' arrest, though on unrelated charges. Holmes, who resided at 1682 Charleston Avenue, two blocks east of Ward's home, has repeatedly denied any involvement in the May 22nd shootings. On March 28, 2008, Holmes was found guilty of first-degree murder in connection with the 2004 shooting of Wendy Morgan. Holmes was sentenced to life in prison with mercy. Today, she continues to serve out her time at the Lakin Correctional Center. She will be eligible for parole in November of 2026. As of this airing, no one has ever been charged with the murders of Michael Dillon, Edric Clark, Dante Ward, or Megan Poston. In the days following the shootings, students at Huntington High School began raising money for the victims' families through the sale of black remembrance bracelets emblazoned with the date of the tragedy. The bracelets were the brainchild of Taylor Bellamy, a senior at Huntington High School, and a longtime friend of Michael Dillon. Within one week of their tragic deaths, all four victims had been laid to rest, now forever lost in all but memory. Over 16 years have now passed since the night the four teens were slain. Police have followed hundreds of leads and continue to insist that the case, however cold, is far from closed. No firm evidence linking Sherylethia Jones to the quadruple shooting has ever been found. That which has surfaced is composed primarily of hearsay and conjecture. Over the last 16 years, authorities have been loath to reveal many new details concerning the shooting, fearful that it may compromise any future prosecution. They would, however, still be interested in hearing from anyone who may have seen or heard anything of consequence during the evening of May 21st and the early morning of May 22nd, 2005. They would be especially interested in hearing from anyone who may have seen the four teens together during the hours and minutes leading up to the shooting. Please watch carefully. Perhaps you may be able to shed some light on 16 years of near darkness. Michael Dillon, Edric Clark, Dante Ward, and Megan Poston were all shot at approximately 4.30 a.m. on Sunday, May 22, 2005. The shooting occurred in front of Dante Ward's home at 1410 Charleston Avenue in the Huntington community of Fairfield West. There were no confirmed eyewitnesses to the actual shooting. A young girl who was awakened by the shots described them as resembling cannon fire, perhaps suggesting a large caliber firearm. The last confirmed sighting of any of the victims came at approximately 3.30 a.m., 
when Dante Ward was observed leaving Fat Cat's Bar on 4th Avenue. Cell phone records show Ward making calls to an acquaintance at the bar until 3.49 a.m. Ward appeared to be alone at the time. Megan Poston may have been seen as late as 3 a.m. at a house party somewhere in downtown Huntington, possibly still clad in her prom dress. Megan and Michael Dillon had earlier attended the Huntington High School prom between 8 p.m. and approximately 10.30 p.m. They may have briefly attended and then left an after-prom party at the Huntington High School. Just how the four teens came to be together at Dante Ward's home at such an early hour is uncertain. Authorities have long hypothesized that the shootings were in some way connected to a cyclical pipeline of drugs and firearms flowing between Huntington, West Virginia and Detroit, Michigan, and that Dante Ward was, for whatever reason, the primary target. Ward's family and friends continue to strongly dispute this assumption. It is also theorized that Ward's three companions were likely killed to ensure their silence. If you have any information concerning the murders of Michael Dillon, Edric Clark, Dante Ward, and Megan Poston, please contact the Huntington, West Virginia Police Department at 304-696-44. Seven zero. Thank you.